All right. Well, why don't we get started? Um, some of you joined us last week, and thank you for for uh, returning. Um, this is the second of three sessions uh, where Liz Pollock is guiding us through uh, Victorian kitchens and cocktails. And um, so last week we talked about uh, kitchens, uh, and I'll share a link to, to that talk if anyone is interested in revisiting it. Um, tonight, uh, she'll be guiding us through making two different cocktails, uh, gin punch and smoking bishop. And then next week, um, we're going to make plum pudding together. So a little of everything before the holidays. Um, so Liz, um, Liz is, um, the owner of, of the cook's bookcase um, and she's been selling cookbooks uh, and uh, antique books since 2007. She just published a book called The Lost Kitchens of Santa Cruz County uh, where she uh, she explores 50 years of, of cuisine in Santa Cruz um, and we're delighted to, to have you back this week. Well, th um, thank you, Courtney and the Dickens Project for having me here this afternoon. And I want to welcome everyone um, that has come, come by. Um, Dickens always helps me get into the holiday spirit. And I find that in all of his books, he celebrates the kitchen as the heart of the home. And extending that uh, motif, if you will, taverns, inns, clubs, and uh, ale houses are the heart of the city. It's where people came together, they talked politics, they met their colleagues, they had business deals, they entertained, they went perhaps after the theater or before the theater and went perhaps after work, not before work, but maybe after work, and uh, talked with friends and colleagues. And so because of the pandemic, I'm just so glad that we're here today with our, we have this opportunity and there are a few images I'd like to share with you. Um, and I will be sharing my PowerPoint presentation. So excuse me for a moment. Excuse me. And please let me know if you can see this. Can you see it? Not yet. Yes, you can see it. Uh, not yet. Um, not yet. Thank you. Okay. Well, this, so uh, this, um, I appreciate your help. Uh, click the share screen button at the bottom of of the screen. Excuse me. On on our screen. Share screen. Yes. Thank you. Yay. And then select the window that you want to share. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, here we go. Part two. <laughs> so um, I'm going to show you some of the illustrations in Dickens' books that depict characters sitting at taverns, enjoying the friends, um, meeting friends. Um, here we are in Bleak House. This is by Hablo Knight Brown. And um, that poor waitress, that's a lot of dishes to carry. Um, this is from 1852. Hablo Knight Brown's um, nickname was Fizz. And Charles Dickens' nickname was Boz when they collaborated. Um, you, 
the, the man on the right is reading a newspaper, something that, that people did, they would go into a tavern, they'd sit there for hours. And um, in Master Humphrey's clock, there's a gentleman tipping back a big tankard. This was published in 1840. Also, Hablo and Knight Brown. He had a way of of accentuating the um, accentuating the characteristics of a character, um, a fat man, a skinny man, a, someone with a long face. This isn't at a tavern, but rather at um, um, his home. I mentioned after the theater um, in Haymarket, um, this 1862, um, a midnight supper, fried oysters, um, a drinks, drinks all around. One of the best uh, references that I personally have found and that I use all the time is the Corning Museum of Glass in New York. So there are um, examples of everyday ordinary glassware, cut glass, as you can see, the wine um, goblets. Ordinary, not, not too expensive, that would be used at a pub, that would be used at a, um, an inn. Here are some rummers. They're not necessarily um, needed always for rum. Uh, it's about 1870. Uh, as you can see, the cut glass, it's a heavy glass. It could be heat proof glass. This got a lot of use. <laughs> this is a punch tumbler and it's from 1830. In my experience, um, I refer to Mrs. Beaton's cookery and household hints um, quite often. And I was going to say that um, the cookbooks that were published in the 19th century had drinks in them, cold drinks, drinks for um, hot weather, cold weather. Um, here's a vignette. Uh, of a silver punch bowl and a ladle. Her book, um, it first came out in 1861, but her books were <clears throat> so uh, popular, everybody had an edition. The first edition, and there is a, um, uh, a facsimile that I've seen, um, it's like the size of Reader's Digest, but about four inches thick. It unbelievably small. It it kind of shocking in that way. This is from a book that was illustrated by Hablo Knight Brown again, by a poor waiter carrying the tankards. I think he's had a long evening. Um, this is by E. Blanchard, and it's dinners and dining at home and abroad and it's from 1860. The Mater D on the left-hand side, I'm not sure what he's making. It may be that um, he has a, a big punch bowl, I'm not sure. Some of the taverns are fabulous uh, examples of Victorian lit um, architecture. Um, I love the lanterns, and this um, particular tavern had private rooms that um, people could meet, uh, have for, maybe for business or talk politics. 
it was it stood there from 1701 to 1893 and unfortunately it was demolished this photograph is from about 1890 and it's the old king's head This is Dickens' own punch ladle. And Charles Dickens was, uh, loved to give parties. He loved to, he loved to be the one that served the punch. Um, he was a, um, a, a, a party animal, I guess you'd say. <laughs> And everywhere he went, for instance, his travels to Switzerland or to France or on his reading tours to America, um, he, people uh, were so glad they ran to go meet him um, at the docks. Um, they put him up in the fancy hotels or the they took him to the fanciest restaurants and the nicest private homes as well. And here we are with David Copperfield, where Mr. Micawber is has made his punch in a earthenware jug. Um, he's uh, he's made it so that um, he could just uh, put it on the stove and keep it hot, which is nice. And I'm going to read to you from David Copperfield, chapter 28. I never saw a man so thoroughly enjoy himself amid the fragrance of lemon peel and sugar, the odor of burning rum, and the steam of boiling water as Mr. Micawber did that afternoon. It was wonderful to see his face shining at us out of a thin cloud of these delicate fumes as he stirred and mixed and tasted and looked as if he were making instead of punch, a fortune for his family, down to the last posterity. Juxtaposed to the beginning of the Christmas Carol, where poor, poor Scrooge is sitting from the fire eating his gruel, and then he's visited by the ghost of Jacob Marley. Here at the end of uh, Christmas Carol, um, stave five, uh, the roaring fire, and um, Bob Cratchit, pr proud as a peacock. This is illustrated by John Lynn, John Leach. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. So I'm going to... Um, run over to my table now and first thing I'm going to be making is uh, the gin punch. So I'm going to stop sharing this. Is that right? There we go. And um, you're able to see, um, yes, and then uh, Courtney, would you please um, do the three, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm not in my kitchen, I'm in my bookstore. Uh -huh. So I will be um, demonstrating this um, this afternoon in a clear mug. And the reason is because I want you to see what's happening. So I want to take um, a fresh lemon cut in half. Um, there are a lot of seeds in this lemon, gosh darn. 
And uh, it's nice that you can do this at, at your house for yourself, or you can double or triple the, uh, the recipe. I'm going to put in a tablespoon of sugar. I'm going to eyeball the tablespoon. I'm going to put uh, same with, with honey. And then I have uh, boiling water. This is so great on a, um, a late fall day. I'm going to stir. I'm going to add in uh, the cinnamon. You see what I'm doing? Excuse me. There you go. And then a clove. A whole clove. I'm going to pour some hot water in here and uh, leaving it enough room for the booze. <laughs> and stir. When making any kind of cocktails at home, I want to emphasize uh, that I'm not pushing any brands of liquor, just whatever can fit into your budget. Um, a tip for me that I've learned is whatever cork or whatever cap I put in a, um, you don't want to lose them. You just put them in a little glass next to you. Here's a, um, a pour that are that is really great. It's um, you can put in the dishwasher. I'm going to put a ounce and a half in here. Um, I use a shot glass. Excuse me for that. I can use a jigger, but I prefer my old standby shot glass. And I, you can also count. So that's the gin. All right, now I'm going to put some Madeira. And um, here's another kind of pour, easy to get. And they're nice um, to have and less mess. And I'm going to put my thing, the jiggy in my glass over there. Also an ounce and a half. What an amazing color and it smells fantastic. Um, I'm going to take a, a whole nutmeg and and grate a little bit. It's a really old-fashioned um, tin nutmeg grater, if you can see that. And that is a There's a cinnamon stick, and that is a gin punch. And that's just for one, but as I say, you can double it or triple it um, if you wish. Part of having um, the holidays is having people over, your friends and family. This may be diff a different time for us. 
Um, and I feel like um, there may be some favorite punches in your family that you that you always have at the holiday that that brings back memories. So let's make a smoking bishop now. I'm going to put that up there. Excuse me. Liz, there are, are a couple of questions for you. Um, how much cinnamon did you add? Um, did somebody ask me a question? Yes. Um, a smoking bishop uh, or a, is made with port. A smoking cardinal is made with champagne. And the whole notion of this, this um, hierarchy kind of like, oh, and a pope is, a, is made with um, burgundy. The, the whole notion is the shape of the glass that is reminiscent of a miter. And um, I've chosen a, uh, a clear glass again, so you can see what's going on. But the, um, some of them were made of very elaborate um, silver. But this afternoon, we're going to make one in this glass here. I'm going to put that over there. going to start, um, I wanted to say that in the recipe of using five Valencia oranges, um, Valencia oranges um, kind of started in Santa Ana, Calif Southern California, but Ventura County has the best citrus um, growers, and um, this particular uh, Valencia is from uh, Ventura County. So we're going to make, if you can see that, we're going to make uh, cuts and put in the um, clo whole cloves. So I've, I took five of these and one lemon. And the reason is because most of the recipes that were in the 19th century called for Seville oranges, but you know, that comes from Spain. So um, uh, the next best thing. And so what I did this morning was I had five oranges and a lemon and I roasted them for um, about half an hour, 45 minutes at a 300 degree oven. And then after I did that, I set them aside. Excuse me. There's not, it looks like a lot of steps, but not really, it just comes comes uh, naturally to you. So in a small saucepan, going to pour a cup of water. And take um, a bit of nice ginger, fresh ginger. Smells really great. And um, after peeling it, then um, cut it into bits. Not, not too much, just a little bit. Um, the spices include ground allspice from allspice berries, which is kind of like a, um, a Jamaican bayberry. So we're going to have a quarter of a teaspoon and a quarter teaspoon of mace. 
Um, mace is so fragrant, and it's really expensive, by the way. <laughs> um, it's the feathery, excuse me, it's the feathery, lacy coating that comes from around a, a nutmeg nut. And so it's very expensive. It comes from Indonesia. Quarter of a teaspoon. And um, so you heat this until boiling, and after that, uh, that boils. Then you set it aside, which I did this morning. All of that happening um, um, after the, uh, the fruit is cooled down a little bit, you put it in a bowl. Excuse me. Set that aside. So you can take a saucepan and um, use an entire bottle of red wine. Um, this is what I like. It, it's kind of like sangria, actually, um, but that's usually on drunk with ice on a, on a really hot day. So this is the opposite. We're going to drink this on a cold day or uh, um, an, a, an occasion to celebrate the holidays. And again, I'm not pushing any kind of, of um, wine, just anything that fits your budget. And to this entire bottle of red wine, I'm going to add a half a cup of brown sugar. You can see that. And on, on the stove, um, stir it until it all dissolves. Put that right there. So the, the stoves that I described last week, um, this is part of the wonderful use of those stoves. If you had one of the Victorian ranges with the six burners, seven inch wide, six burners. You could do a lot of this at the same time. So um, speeding up things a little bit, if I may. So here's the bowl of fruit. The water and the um, ginger and the spices. I'm going to pour this over the fruit. Believe it or not, after this is cooked, you pour this over the fruit. <laughs> and then to cover that and let this sit for about um, six or seven hours and overnight, something like that. So I'm going to pretend that that was done. And uh, the next step is to use some of the fruit in here. You can either use a, um, you know, 
uh, manual juicer like that. I like to use this, this citrus press. And this is from, um, excuse me. This is from waiting around all afternoon. You cut the, the fruit in half. Then I'm going to juice it in here. And then when that all, all of that fruit is, is done like that, excuse me, I'm going to um, strain all that out of the bowl. And maybe you, you don't want like a bit of clove stick or um, an odd seed from the lemon, for instance, something like that. Now, excuse me for a minute because I have my real pot in the other room. Just a moment. Uh -huh. Excuse me. which is here. Fantastic. Smells so good. And um, to this um, pot, then, I'm going to add an entire bottle of, of port. Port is a fortified um, wine, Portuguese from Portugal. So I'm going to make it a smoking bishop calls for port. I'm going to pour the whole bottle in there. This serves 12. And, and I was going to point out that if there's not 12 of you this today or this particular season, you can um, put it in like a ball jar and keep it, um, you know, keep it for a while. So I'm going to heat that until um, almost boiling, but not quiet take the, the rummer and it's it's it will steam and hence named of smoky bishop and then um, but because of Dickens novels being so popular it's kind of like I was thinking earlier it's kind of like the Beatles we couldn't wait to hear their next song or couldn't wait for their next record and people couldn't wait um, uh, until Dickens next book and um, and the next illustration and the next story but, and of course Christmas Carol has been was one of the most requested items um, for Dickens to read aloud on his tours especially in America. There we go, excuse me. So here we have Smoking Bishop. What I'd like to do is Float a little bit of um, a very thin sliced lemon on top. And there you have a 
smoking bishop. And then, so here's our gin punch and the smoking bishop. And as an aside today, um, I wanted to, maybe I'm repeating myself. I had a wonderful time. I had a grand time at UC Santa Cruz and I majored in, in comparative literature. I, some of my favorite classes were in Dickens with John Jordan, the head of the Dickens project. And I, um, reading his books during the Dickens project and universe every summer is just one of my very favorite things to do. And um, I'm so glad that to be able to share these with you today. Um, I'm interested in your questions and comments. Cheers. Hi, Liz. Um, I'm going to come up here so I can hear you. And then you can do the the little three um, dots if you wish. Hmm. Okay. So there was a question early on about um, what type of red wine um, was uh, suggested. Is it a Burgundy oh. or does it matter? You no, know, I. I, I used a table wine. I used, it could be a Cabernet. It could be just a, something that fits within your budget. Doesn't have to be like a, uh, you know, a sweet wine. Cause you've got the, you have the fruit making it sweet and you have a little bit of the sugar to sweeten the wine anyway. Um, port is, as I mentioned, is fortified with brandy. So got a lot going on there in sweet. And I wished I could look up the calories for you, but absolutely in a glass of this smoking bishop, there will be um, exactly, port is really sweet by itself. There will be uh, a lot of grams of sugar, unfortunately. So a little bit at a time, perhaps. Any, any other questions? Um, regarding the, where do we get the recipe? I, um, I pass that along to Courtney and she can, she can um, send that to you if you don't mind. One of the things that I experienced as uh, a bartender in the 80s was at Christmas time, I would make a big bowl of eggnog. And it's such a treat. I mean, you don't drink eggnog every day and you don't drink the smoking bishop every day. That's, that's what, um, that's, that was Dickens' way to congratulate um, Bob Cratchit and to say that it's something that they're going to share. That's a thing they're going to share. And I, as opposed to the whole years of not sharing with him. So that's, it's really nice. So uh, Vanessa is wondering if you have a favorite Victorian era beverage, Liz. Well, I'd never made Smoking Bishop before, so I'm going to say this. Um, anything with brandy is fun. Uh, uh, tea with tea with brandy, it sounds medicinal, but this is not medicinal. This is more... Uh, 
um, something that you could, and if you're keeping it hot, you could, you could drink it all afternoon or not all evening actually, or with your friends. And, and I was going to reiterate the, the ball jar, you know, keep it, um, um, put it into jars or small receptacles so you don't have that big uh, saucepan in your fridge. And it might be a great um, gift to share, actually. You know, like you're sharing your Christmas cookies or something. You could share this with your neighbors. So. White wine warmed with toast. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine uh, made, uh, what is it called, aviation, aviator, aviation uh, in bulk. And uh, she arrived with um, a, a portable bar on her back and she, she brought it to a gathering. And it was just such a, a wonderful way to, uh, to just start a, a conversation because gosh, that bar was really amazing. Like, it was like a picnic basket, but so much better. Um, oh, that's nice. And yeah. Uh, yeah, seasonal gifts. It's perfect. I, I also wanted to say that the um, many of the celebrations we were reading about in the, uh, about the Victorian era, or in fact, you know, centuries ago, was uh, the wassail bowl, bowl of wassail, or a glass, a mug of wassail. Well, that's uh, made with apples and uh, um, a fermented mead or, or a beer or an ale. And it is sweet. And this wine, uh, uh, Smoking Bishop, is not that sweet. It has more of a tang to it. Um, I'd like to make the 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 smoking cardinal with champagne because that's I love champagne so I'd like to make that next. Oh yes, I would happy to talk about the smoking. So the smoking pope is the um, same recipe but made with burgundy and. The smoking cardinal made with champagne with the same um, same recipe but with champagne and uh, the smoking bishop as we just did and it's because of the glass the the vessel being the same shape as the mitre um, hat for those uh, uh, those people in the church and some of the um, these glasses or the vessels rather were made of silver, very elaborate um, carvings. And I used a glass one, but um, this could be put into any kind of you know punch bowl or punch glass. So if anyone is in Santa Cruz or comes to Santa Cruz for our Dickens Universe conference the next time we're able to host it in person, in Special Collections, we have what's called, what we refer to our, as our precious object. And the precious object is a, um, a punch ladle that Dickens used to own. It mm. is made out of whale baleen. Um, and really? yeah, someone had purchased it um, and had it shipped uh, here from Europe. And um, because uh, whale baleen is, uh, it's, you're not supposed to, to own it or sell it or trade it. Um, this item was confiscated. And um, 
somehow uh, the authorities found the Dickens project and they offered us um, this, this item. And um, this was way before my time. So I'm not sure of the particulars, but it's, it resides in special collections and it, it's pretty fun uh, to, to think that uh, Dickens made punch and, and served uh, his friends with this. I'd love to see it. Next time the McHenry Library is open, I'd love to see it. It'd be fun. Mm. Well, um, port and Madeira and all kinds of wines were, it's not so far away uh, from England and that was uh, um, brought in by ships and imported by the, the wine merchants. And I'm not sure what, um, how expensive that was. I know that s some of the, <clears throat> some of the taverns and inns, I should have made an image of it. Some of the, this is Daisy and she's not allowed in here. Excuse me. Some of the um, taverns have um, some menus for this. And I, I, I kind of remember that something like a gin, this gin punch was six shillings. And so that today is, what is that like? A Two dollars, something like that. So that's. Um, but I'm not sure about a whole, um, a whole bottle. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. But certainly Dickens had the money to give all these parties. And when he came to America, again, he was, you know, lavished. The most fantastic parties were held in his honor and um, on board ship, of course. And, and people outdid themselves um, honoring him. Good question. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you, Vanessa, for that um, passage about um, the glass of hot wine and the toast. How fascinating. I didn't remember that. I'll put my mic on list to say it doesn't sound at all appetizing to me. True. Bless you. <laughs> and yes, I would, uh, Marsha, I would tell people to heat it up first. You bet. If you're going to give it to your neighbors. Next week, I'm going to uh, present um, plum pudding and I'll get you the um, ingredients, I hope by tomorrow, if that's okay, Courtney. And it's a recipe that uh, Penn Vogler has in her book, um, uh, Dickens Cookery, and um, it'll be fun. We can, we can have a lot of fun making that. So I, I just want to reiterate, um, because of the, the way that we set up the registration for this, uh, this series, we aren't collecting email addresses. So if you would like me to send you the, the recipes, uh, please just uh, send me a direct message uh, with your email address and I'll, I'll send them right over to you. And um, thank you again, Courtney, for having me. And thank you to, for everyone for your comments. And, and it was nice to see everyone's face, smiling faces. <laughs> 
Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll be doing it again um, next week, same time, same place, uh, four o'clock. And uh, yeah, we'll be making plum pudding. Yay!